Um, and uh, good evening. <coughs> I've never been introduced like that, Jim. Thank you for that. I feel, feel slightly bashful and blushing. Um, I'm going to try and, and strike what might be a strange balance between having quite a strong point of view while standing up and then neutral and diplomatic and curatorial when I'm sitting down. So if you can bear with me for 10 minutes and I'll share my thoughts on the CEO and society before welcoming uh, Paul, Douglas and, and Deborah to the stage. Um, Jim is right. Um, I believe that the world needs to change and I believe that the CEO and the corp organisation is an absolute and fundamental agent for that change. And in preparing for this evening uh, and in discussing with the panel, I really wanted to ask a bunch of CEOs with whom I work quite closely, what do they think makes for an enlightened CEO? And what you're about to see over the next 10 minutes or so are the answers to, to some of those questions. For me, there are a few principles that I believe makes a, an enlightened CEO. First and foremost, an enlightened CEO is someone who does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. They act well above and beyond shareholder value. I really don't understand this sort of fake orthodoxy as I see it of profit maximization. I think the enlightened CEO puts radical honesty and radical transparency at the heart of their organization and that they believe in a new social democracy of corporate behavior. And by that I mean social because it is of and between real people and democratic because it gives voice to all. But above all, the enlightened CEO is someone who leads with actions, not words, with what they do, not what they say. But when I put this question to a number of CEOs, you quite often get met with a strange response. I ask the question, so what do you think the hallmark of an enlightened CEO is? And the first soft answer is often, uh, come on, it's not that difficult a question. And quite often you hear a CEO say, I'll ask my PR team to come back to you in a few hours if that's okay. And that may give you a clue as to why I think we should trust me that PR is dead. And instinctively, sorry, the CEOs who instinctively and immediately answer that question tend on a, on a law of averages to be the um, enlightened ones. Ian Cheshire, many of you know, CEO Kingfisher, an enlightened CEO, poster child, I think, for many in the sustainable movement. When asked this question, he said, the enlightened CEO is someone who cares about the overall impact today, but also ensures that business is sustainable in 50 years' time. He actually gave a much longer quote, which is, which is on my blog post. John Maltby, who's the CEO of Williams & Glynn, which is currently divesting from RBS and is certainly a leader of the next generation of better bankers, said that an enlightened CEO is someone who has a clear sense of business and social purpose and went on to add that it was about putting the customer first, the customer before the organization, and not the other way around. There's a chairman of a FTSE 100 that I was speaking to last week. Um, I've anonymized him for what I'm about to say, and I'm sorry that he looks a bit like Alfred Hitchcock in profile. Uh, that may be my clip art. And he made the point, talking about enlightenment, that the only permanent in business is morality, which I thought was an interesting and insightful thought. And then he paused, and I wrote this down because I didn't want to get it wrong. He said, the point is, Robert, there is absolutely no place today for the who do we fuck today mentality that we used to see at Royal Bank of Scotland under Fred Goodwin. He said, I used to, he was a director, a former director of RBS, and he walked in every day, and that was the question that they asked themselves as they went to work. Ronan Dunn, asked by Jim, what do you make an enlightened CEO? It's the CEO of, of O2 Telefonica said, we must place sustainability at the heart of business planning, all of which is great for a crowd that is focused on sustainability. But I guess there's the Mandy Rice Davis question, which is, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? And one of the challenges that we have is to see through whether this is PR, whether this is spin, whether this is people trying to say the right thing because they think it's the right thing to say, not because it is actually the right thing to do, and to ask, is that right? Is, are they believable? Are they credible as enlightened CEOs? Is their rela relationship the right one between them as a CEO and society? So this is my Star Trek joke, for those that aren't Trekkies. The data, what does the data say? Well, the data says that 93% of CEOs believe that environmental, social, and governance issues will be important or very important for the future of business. 
That's from the 2014 UN Global Compact. But of course they'd say that. And one of the things that I look at in my day job is to ask the question, when a chairman in particular comes to me and says, we really must place sustainability at the heart of the organisation, does he or she really mean that, or are they doing that because they think that it leads to the sort of regulatory governance, the regulatory behaviour that, um, that official and policy makers uh, want to see? But the data is, of course, quite compelling. This is from the HSBC Global Climate Change Benchmark Survey uh, that came out earlier this year, and it said that sustainable investment paid returns of 19.8% in 2013. That was the first time ever that sustainable investments outstripped the global equities market. Havas, advertising group, 23 countries study, 134,000 consumers, 700 brands, pointed out that meaningful brands outperform the market by 120%. Accenture, they're turning green into gold. Transformational leaders, leaders who have high sustainability performance as well as high business performance or financial performance, outperform their respective industries by between 59 and 65%. So the data is compelling if you can connect it with the CEOs who believe it and can deliver it through actions, not just words. And a sanitary reminder from the same Havas study, most people worldwide would not care if more than 73% of brands disappeared tomorrow. I find that the most compelling statistic for a world that spends billions of dollars on its advertising, its marketing, its communications, and its brand management. Back to the world of the CEO. Here's Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. I don't know whether people followed this SPAC recently at a, at a shareholders uh, uh, meeting where someone from something called the NCPPR, which describes itself as dedicated to providing free market solutions to today's public policy problems, I think we know where they're coming from, challenged him on all the soft, fluffy stuff that Tim Cook, who's normally very calm and very reserved, that Tim Cook and Apple uh, does. Why are you not squeezing the business for every last ounce of profit? This is an NGO, a think tank, a lobby group, call it what you will, that argues for profit maximisation. I don't consider the bloody ROI, said Tim Cook, when I figure out how to make my devices accessible for blind people. The enlightened CEO is the person who does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. This, of course, chimes with what Michael Sandel wrote in his What Money Can't Buy uh, uh, book last year and talks about the moral limits of markets. And I mentioned in my introduction about this challenge, I think, uh, to the prevailing orthodoxy about profit, about what is the right profit or why profit has to be maximised. And for those who haven't read it, I would suggest it is the one great book of the year that you really must read. Ask the question, what is the moral limits to markets? What is it that money can't buy? Steve Denning, management thinker, writing in Forbes magazine, also sort of chimes a lot of what Sandel was saying and, and some of the arguments that I put forward as well. He says... Most of what we know about management today is plain, flat, dead, wrong. He talks about the shift from the traditional economy to the creative economy. The creative economy is collaborative. The creative economy exists in networks. The traditional economy, traditional leadership, traditional management, he argues, is actually something that was born in an age of monarchy and has been disrupted massively and forever uh, by technology. And he sees the customer as the key beneficiary of all of this. The creative economy belongs to the customer. And in my world, in my language, in my writings, I'll say to customer and the employee too. So he talks about what we see, which is the shift from hierarchies and control to networks of shared influence. Cliff Oswick is not a CEO. He's the deputy dean of Cass Business School down the road, where I'm a visiting professor. And, and Cliff came up with this uh, soundbite, which I rather like. The CEO needs to think and behave like a social activist. And I like that. I think that's a very powerful metaphor for how the enlightened CEO should behave. And this is me. Actually, it's not me. It's Robert Owen, personal hero, who, of course, captured much the spirit of what we're talking about of enlightenment with his new Lanark Mills at the end of the um, uh, 18th, early 19th century. And what he talked about was obviously what the Victorians came to see as a sense of mutuality, of, co of cooperation, of paternalism, as it was then seen, but a genuine care for societal issues. But as I've written in my book, I believe 
that what we need to see is enlightened public leadership. And that is activist, it's co-produced, it's citizen-centric, and it's society first. Why is it activist? Well, let's go back to, to Cliff Oswick's point. The one thing that we are not going to be able to change is what we can see is this mega trend of individual empowerment. That's the stuff that is taking us right the way into the middle past of the 21st century. Power continues to shift from states to citizen, from employer to employee, from corporation to consumer. And as a result, we become more atomized for sure, but more activist, empowered by technology as well. And uh, power and influence becomes much more asymmetrical, much more difficult to handle. And therefore, the enlightened CEO is someone who recognizes this activism, can channel this activism, the activism of others, and can make leadership work within active networks. Why is it co-produced? Because power and influence does not belong any longer to elites, going to the Steve Denning point. The enlightened CEO, and all the trust data will bear this out, is someone who understands that trust resides with citizens, not with corporations, with regular people. And therefore, co-producing through wise crowds the future of trust, the future of business, is the way forward. If we can co-create on YouTube or make it on Nike chambers, tra uh, trainers, why can we not co-create strategies, co-produce strategies in business? And this is an argument for mutualized business models. It's an argument for cooperative ownership. And I've always said that if you cannot mutualize the model, you can at least mutualize the thinking. And you look at the excellence of John Lewis' partnership, of Mondragon, or of HCL Technologies. There are plenty of good examples around the world. And it's citizen-centric and society first, because that is where the big issues lie. Businesses, corporations, CEOs do not exist for personal gratification or glorification, or indeed the, only the ascendancy of profit. They have to reconnect the purpose of business with the needs of society, first and foremost. Why do they need to do this? Because they have a responsibility. This is Darcy Wilson Reimer, who's the CEO of Costcutter Supermarkets Group, formerly CEO of Starbucks in the UK. The leaders' values and behaviours are proxy for the rest of the company's values and behaviour. And as we'll come on to hear from Paul Westbury, because we were chatting earlier, one of the toughest challenges that an enlightened CEO faces is the ability to drive culture change through the organisation. And I've worked with plenty of CEOs who get it absolutely and then spend time fighting with their boards, fighting with the next level of management to see that change through. For those of you that read the blog post or have subscribed to the book, you will see an extract that I've written about Richard Branson. And I asked the question, is Richard Branson an enlightened CEO or is he a careful PR construct? I think he's the latter. So there you have the B team. There you have Richard trying to save the planet in all sorts of ways, shapes and forms. Jim and I, I think, disagree uh, on this. But I would say that actually, Richard Branson isn't an enlightened CEO, he's a traditionalist. He was born in the age of monarchy, as Steve Denning describes. And I believe that what you see is a careful PR construct. And I wrote a blog post about this, and I was uh, picked up on and, and, um, and supported by, uh, bizarrely, uh, the British ambassador to Lebanon. And he said, what Robert is writing about leadership, and what Robert is writing about PR, what Robert is writing about Richard Branson, belongs to diplomacy as well. And I thought that was, uh, that was quite in interesting. He said rephrasing my argument, that PR and business draws too much from legacy institutions uh, that speak the language of institutional authority. He said, non-enlightened leaders don't see that there is a new balance between citizens, state, business and society. The non-enlightened leadership remains hierarchical in an age of authority, and it promotes bureaucracy and generalisms over expertise uh, and uh, specialisms. But ultimately, it seeks to manage, to control, to spin, rather than to share interests across more fluid networks. That's why I don't believe that Richard Branson is an enlightened CEO. So in concluding and before welcoming the, the guests to the stage, the enlightened public leader for me looks like this. Activist, co-produced, citizen-centric, society first. That's what I talked about before. A believer in profit optimization, not profit maximization talks about citizens, doesn't try and sell everything to consumers, understands that it's about meeting needs, not again selling to wants, believes in collaboration, not control, in networks, not hierarchies, in agile ecosystems, and not suffocating bureaucracies. These, for me, are the core hallmarks of an enlightened leader who can reconnect the role of the CEO with society. But above all, and not just playing to the audience, 
The enlightened CEO is someone who loves, respects, listens to and participates with a wise crowd. Thank you very much.